Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, it's Football at Four. Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Of course, Andrew goes in on a Thursday as we wind down Super Bowl 57. Look ahead to the offseason. We heard from Nick Sirianni today. We heard briefly from Howie Roseman. He didn't give us a whole heck of a lot. We heard from Jonathan Gannon today as well, and we do have some news on the Eagles moving forward here. Let's bring in Andrew DeCecco on a Football at Four Thursday edition of the Sports Bash Live on 97.3 ESPN and, of course, the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. DeCecco, I have a spellbinder here for you. How's that feel? Um, I'm open to it. Let's hear it. <laughs> the spellbinder was the beer we had at the Whining Pig, man. You were all over it. Oh, yeah. Well, not as much as you. You were there before I got there and after I left. So, well, you uh, know, I'm bringing everybody together. I have to keep the, the group together, right? Well, I guess that's that's one way to put it. Yeah. I mean, you guys left. I had a different group of people I was meeting with. I can't just leave them there. You know what I mean? But uh, it was well, good. I, to... I had an early day and a long day of work ahead. Uh, Radio Row, and, That's right. and then uh, obviously the media obligation, so I had to uh, be responsible. <laughs> I did tell the listeners about the pizza delivery, and uh, we had people text it in like, oh, my God. I w-, you know, I, when I said to – Andrew was the guy who recommended the pizza, and I said, well, why don't we just get it delivered here? And can we do that? I said, sure, why not? And uh, we got the pizza delivered right there. It was a great call by you. What was the name of the pizza joint? Pomo Pizza. Pomo Pizza. First- 705 First Street, I believe, in Arizona, so in Phoenix, Arizona, so shout out to them. <laughs> it was a good time. It was good to see you down there, man. You had great coverage all week long, and obviously you were hustling around a little bit more than I was because you were going to cover the teams. But I want to get a couple quick thoughts to start. Let me just get your overview. You were at Super Bowl 57, and just give me an overview of some of the highlights. Uh, let's start with today. The question that Nick Sirianni got asked, why not go for it on fourth down and three? I don't even think that's a question in my mind. You got to punt the ball there, right? Yeah, in, in the Super Bowl, when the margin for error is so small and you're going against a team, a high octane offense like the Kansas City Chiefs, I think you have to play it close to the vest in that scenario. And um, that wasn't something that I was paused and scratched my head and said, What's he doing there? No. I, I, I mean, I agree with it. And I think he, I believe he said 32 out of 32 head coaches would do the same. Now, the other question on fourth and seven. <laughs> Give me your thoughts there, because I got a couple thoughts on that. Number one, I hated the timeout on second and 11. Just take the five-yard loss, especially if you're willing to kick the field goal. If you're willing to kick the field goal, take the five-yard loss and save the timeout. The timeout comes, and then I hate the play they run out of the timeout, which forces them to kick a field goal. But on fourth and seven, on the 20, do you go for it, or do you like the three? Uh, I think you go for it there, given the magnitude of the game. How much time is left and knowing <clears throat> if, if Mahomes has the ball last, and we've talked about this, blank, Jeff and I, on Radio Row last week, if Mahomes has, the, uh, Mahomes has the ball last, there's a good likelihood that, one, they control the clock and milk it down, but also that they're going to score a touchdown and not go for three and finish the deal. So knowing that, Mike, I think that the Eagles really should have been a little bit more aggressive in that scenario. Yeah, I agree with you there. I probably would have gone for it, but, I mean, I, I hate that timeout, man. I hate – that timeout is more valuable than the five-yard loss. Do you agree or no? I do. I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. I, I, I totally wonder in that situation why these coaches constantly take that timeout in that spot. But uh, that was that. Uh, another thing he mentioned in the second half, you were there. I want to get – first off, I, I, you know, they got asked today. They said both teams played on the field. But you were there. Give me your thoughts on the condition of that field and how it affected not the Eagles, both teams. <clears throat> well, it was undoubtedly the, the surface was sleek, and, and you started to see both teams ro- slip. But I thought it really impacted the Eagles in particular, who they have a pass rush gamut of, of players who are really – their game is predicated on uh, explosiveness off the line, short area quickness, and speed, particularly someone like a Hassan Reddick and a Josh Sweat. And those are the two guys that I saw really struggle to, to, to find their footing more than most. And there was times where they got a quick get off, but they really couldn't, couldn't get their grip on the ground and they lost their footing. And then all of a sudden <clears throat> it, it, it opened the door for Mahomes to have enough time 
to survey the field and get the ball out to his receiver. So I really thought that it did, it did, um, it, it really did impact the Eagles. But, you know, like Howie said today, and like I've said since Sunday, both teams had to play on it. The Eagles aren't one to make excuses. You know, they saw how, how much of a bad look it was when you heard the 49ers still talking about a game from two weeks ago. So they certainly weren't going to make any excuses. But that is something that Hassan Reddick alluded to in his postgame presser at the podium after the game, that he thought that the field was, was in pretty bad conditions and he did struggle with the element. Um, Andrew DiCecco, football for, you know, you were there the second half. I want to get your thoughts on how the Chiefs offense was so much more successful in the second half than in the first. What did, did you know, what was the difference in that game? Because the Eagles defense only gave up seven points in the first half of that game. So how did the game take a twist? Well, it was a master class in, in, in game and play calling from Andy Reid. I thought the Eagles really struggled, particularly on those two touchdowns uh, in pre-snap motion, the jet motion, and uh, Kadarius Tony and um, Sky Moore. They also ran the ball far more efficiently than the Eagles did and controlled that clock. So uh, I thought Isaiah Pacheco ran hard. I thought Jarek McKinnon made a really sound play at the end of the game to, to you know take a knee down at the one-yard line, and he caught a few passes off in the flat. I thought he was even going to have a bigger role than he did. But as it were, I thought that the, the Chiefs, they didn't do anything crazy from a passing game standpoint. I believe Mahomes only had 182 yards passing. But it was the decisions that he made in the moments that he made them, the running game, and a culmination of just a masterful play calling. I thought Jonathan Gannon got out in the second half uh, by Andy Reid and Eric Bieniemy. So you mentioned John Gannon. Let's move forward to him. He got introduced today in Arizona. Um, he hasn't had a chance to really address what happened in that second half. But uh, what about the loss of John Gannon and, you know, the impact that might have moving forward? A lot of people don't think it's going to make any impact. There are people out there that are ready to have a parade as if the Eagles won the Super Bowl for getting rid of Gannon. But what? let's let cooler heads prevail from your perspective. What are the Eagles going to be losing with John Gannon out? Well, oftentimes it's the backup quarterback who's the most popular guy in one city. And it seems to be in Philadelphia that the defensive coordinator is the least popular uh, person associated <laughs> with, with said team, you know, whether or not it's uh, Billy Davis or Billy Davis obviously wasn't really, it wasn't really good, but Jim Schwartz was, you know, he, he was the catalyst behind a Super Bowl winning defense. And he wasn't very popular, but you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that Jonathan Gannon is the best defensive coordinator that the Eagles have had since Jim Johnson. Um, as far as just being able to command the room, maximize his personnel, um, I, I thought that he was really good in, in teaching the game. There's a lot of players that developed underneath him, and you, you wouldn't find one player there that's going to say anything bad about him. I thought he really found a, really, a, a way to relate to his team and find ways to put them in positions to be successful. There were instances that, uh, such as you know, the most inter- inopportune times in the Super Bowl where he got outcoached. I thought he was far too passive most of the time, but – when on the game's biggest stage, he played more man coverage and blitz more than he ever has. So I don't, I don't know that that was the, he, he didn't just rest on his laurels there. Um, but I thought that he should have found different ways to counter it, what they were doing. And he just got clearly out coached in the second half of that game. But the most part of it, for the most part of his career, Mike, I thought in Philadelphia, he was, uh, I thought he got a little bit more flack than was certainly warranted. And he did a lot of things that sort of went un, undetected to the common, to the common eye. I thought he did a lot of things well. Um, in terms of replacing him, you're one of those guys that, uh, you know, you, you go under the radar, you know, some names that others don't know. Uh, there is a report from Josina Anderson that the Eagles are going to request an interview with Vance Joseph. Uh, so I'd like your thoughts on Joseph. And if you have a name that you would target to replace John Gannon. Yeah. Vance, Vance Joseph is a nice name. If you want to look outside, the uh, the organization for to bring somebody in who has a lot of experience. Obviously, he was a head coach in this league. D- didn't necessarily have the the most uh, didn't have a, a roster flourishing with uh, brimming with talent. And I thought that that was reflected. I think his unit this year had 11 interceptions, 36 sacks. It was highlighted by uh, Byron. They had Byron Murphy. You had Jalen Thompson, who's a safety in which I like. Um, Marco Wilson, they, they had some players, but not like bona fide blue chip players, Buda Baker, of course. And he's an aggressive minded defensive coordinator. So it would be a lot more blitzing. Uh, his defenses have historically struggled defending the tight end. But um, I, I think Sean Desai, who is a Temple grad, would be someone that, that could garner a little bit of interest here. I think he also has some familiarity with Vic Bangio's defense. 
But for me, Mike, I'm looking at uh, Denard Wilson, the Eagles defensive backs coach and passing game coordinator. I think that when you look at somebody who, when, from a continuity standpoint, for one, but someone who, for me, when I look at a young coach, I look at a coach that how, how are they able to teach the game to their secondary? How are they able to get the best performance out of his personnel? And when I look, you can go down the list. James Bradbury had a resurgence coming off a down year with the Giants, an inconsistent year, but he was playing an assistant that was better suited to his skill set, and he's going to parlay that into a sizable payday. Darius Slay had a great season. Mark Epps is one of the most unsung heroes on that team, and I thought he quietly had, a, had his best season as a pro. Reed Blankenship, undrafted free agent. He stepped in and was a, a big piece down the stretch and really came into his own, and now we're looking at him as a possible starter next year. So there's a lot of players there that I thought took a step forward under his tutelage, and obviously Jonathan Gannon had a big part of that as well. But those are some of the things that I look for when you look at a young coach and if they're ready to take that next step. Well, and I think he, he – go yeah. ahead. Yeah, you bring up an interesting point because we've had people text into the show saying, well, is it Gannon's scheme or did they just have so much talent that it made him look good? And I, I go to Hassan Reddick. You know, Hassan Reddick, Vance Joseph, by the way, had Reddick in Arizona for two seasons, didn't use him very well to the point that they just let Reddick go. Now, Reddick comes here, he goes to Carolina, has a good year, but not a year like he had here. So is it the scheme, or did John Gannon just have so much talent, or did he do a good job with the talent that he had? And, and that goes with my point. I think that he does, that Gannon did a great job of maximizing his personnel to their fullest extent, right? Putting Hassan Reddick in a situation in which he's going to flourish. I think, he, I think if I'm correct on this, Hassan had a year under Joseph that he had 12 and a half. Yeah, he did. He had 12 and a half sacks. But yeah, his second year. That, his second year there. The but it, it, when we, you, weren't, uh, you were down at the uh, Radio Row with us. We had uh, Devon Kennard on, and he kind of laughed at the way he said he was rooting so hard for Reddick because he knew Reddick. He said Reddick, this game meant so much for him because it was in Arizona, in that stadium. And he was laughing. He said, you know, they used him so poorly in Arizona. Like, he, he understood that he, he did, they didn't know what to do with him there. Yeah, and, you know, when you're a player and you believe in your skill set and you know that you were improperly deployed, you want to prove yourself. You want to show, hey, I'm in, it's not me. I'm in a system right now that's going to accentuate my skill set. You have something to prove. You have a chip on your shoulder. These guys, and, and you know, to a man, you know, going back to Jonathan Gannon, all these players wanted to play hard for him. Nick Sirianni was a big-time advocate for him. You heard him after the Giants game. Uh, his voice was, was resounding throughout the locker room, and there's a lot of people that sung his praises because he was doing all of these different things behind the scenes that you don't necessarily see or don't, they don't show up in the box score because of his leadership and ability to command a room and find a way to put his players in the best position to be successful uh, more often than not. Uh, talking with Andrew Checo, football of four. Uh, John Gannon introduced in Arizona today. The Eagles need a new coordinator. They also need a new offensive coordinator. What are the Eagles losing with Shane Steichen, who got emotional uh, when talking about the Eagles? So that bond, obviously, very strong when he got his introductory press conference yesterday. Actually, I think it was two days ago. But uh, So, number one, uh, how important of a role did Steichen play in this offense in Jalen Hurts? He played an immense role, and I really thought he caught a brilliant game in the Super Bowl really all season long since he took over play-calling duties, even last season, the early, uh, the early part of last season when he took the reins from Sirianni. Um, just, a, just someone that really understands the game of football um, at, a, at a macro level and, and uh, at a micro level. He's just a brilliant mind. I thought that he found the way to best utilize his personnel and draw, draw up some really creative plays. He gave Jalen Hurts. Uh, a lot more uh, autonomy and liberties at the line to do his thing and, and take advantage. And, you know, he had confidence to, to really open up the full, the full playbook and take advantage uh, of, of his quarterback and his diverse skill set. And I thought that there's a lot of players this year that you talk about development that took a, an immense step forward. You can go down the list. Miles Sanders had his best season as a pro. Devontae Smith came into his own. A.J. Brown was, was – you know, a top three, top five receiver in the in the league this year. So these, this doesn't just happen by accident. All these guys are being put in position to be successful, and they're all developing, and everything was clicking on all cylinders this year. Uh, candidates to replace him, I know that uh, you know Brian Johnson pretty well. Would you imagine that he will be the next guy? And if so, uh, that synergy that should remain between Steichen, uh, Hertz, and if Johnson takes over. Yeah, and you know, before I even get into it, I, I think that 
and I've seen this question kicked around a lot over the past 48 hours. I think the Eagles are going to miss Jonathan Gannon more than they'll miss Shane Steichen. Um, both are immense losses, don't get me wrong, but I think, Brian, they already have they, – they had two coaches, really, that are already in-house that are fully equipped to, to take the reins on offensive coordinator and Kevin Petullo. Uh, but Brian Johnson, for me, Mike, is the guy. Obviously, when you look at his continuity and, and relationship with Jalen Hurst that dates back to when Hurts, I believe, was two years old. He knows him inside and out. He was instrumental in his development this year, having a, you know sort of serving as a catalyst to, to getting him prepared for the MV, MVP caliber season that he, that he had last year and having him there and being able to kind of take that a step further and, and uh, elevate the offense and having been there and being been involved in the game plan, by the way, he didn't certainly didn't call the plays, but he's involved uh, as, as you've heard. Um, I think just having that continuity piece there mm-hmm. with the players that are already in place would really be uh, beneficial to the Eagles. And it would kind of allow them to uh, continue next season without much of a hitch, because obviously there's going to be some sort of a of a growing pain knowing that you're losing two coordinators. I think with with Brian Jackson there, it sort of alleviates that uh, at least a little bit. Yeah, uh, and his relationship with Hertz too. These guys have known each other since Hertz was what, like four years old. So obviously, Hertz feels very comfortable. I would imagine with that transition as well. Yeah, and, and I think I think that's something that's going to play a big part in it. Um, knowing that that you have a quarterback that you're going to pay a lot of money to. In, in the coming months or, or weeks or however it is, you want you want him to be comfortable and you want him to have a little bit of say in and in, in what's going to and who's going to be presiding over the offense moving forward. And I think Brian Johnson, from a comfortability standpoint, but also he's one of the bright young minds football. And I think that when you're looking at a team that has so many bona fide playmakers, I think he's going to find a way to deploy them and accentuate all of their skill sets respectively. And I, I think he's going to be someone that we're talking about. Uh, next season, the season after, as someone that is a viable head coaching candidate because I really do think that he's going to see early success. Uh, and, and today I thought one of the bigger moments of the press conference was uh, Nick Sirianni saying he does not want to call plays. So the new coordinator, they will step in and get a role calling plays, right? So that's that's a big thing for the next guy who gets this job. Yeah, and, and I think that was something that Nick Sirianni had to feel his way around early on. You know, sometimes as a young head coach, you want to do it all. You want your fingerprints to on everything. But I think he soon realized that, hey, you know, while there are some coaches that do that and do that to great success, that's not my bag. That's not what I want to do. And I think him being the more of the CEO and having a broader perspective of, of, of running the team, I think that suited him better. And you saw the difference on the field and how everything materialized. So I think that he does, he's, he's fully aware of, of the success the team has had since he turned the play calling duties over. And I think he wants to continue that to ensure long-term success. Yeah, I know um, this offseason is going to be an interesting one. We didn't hear a lot from Howie on that. The only question really had to do with Jalen Hurts. This is going to be interesting, uh, uh, Andrew, because you look at what's next. You got Herbert, you got Burrow, and you got Hurts. I would imagine those teams want to be the first one to get done, not the last one, right? Yeah, absolutely. You want to be the first one to get it done uh, and, and, and reset that market. 50 mils. That sounds comfortable to you or <laughs> I, I would say, I would say, you know, anywhere from 47 to 51 or 52 is what you're going to be looking at. Jeez. Unbelievable. Right. I mean, Hey, it's the only, the only thing I have with that is he's only done it for the one year. And, and that's the hard part. It's like, we're in a society where I want to see you do it more than once, but the fact that he's only gotten the one opportunity when he needed to have the one opportunity, because realistically he does have a contract for one, I think it's 1.5, right, next year or something like that? Right, but what I will say is Jalen Hurts has checked off every single box season, and any remaining boxes that one may have had were answered on the game's biggest stage yeah. on Sunday. I really thought that that was one of the more remarkable performances from a quarterback I've ever seen. And from someone going into that game with so many question marks, how is he going to be able to conduct himself? I, I thought he was the best player on the field on Sunday, and you want to get somebody like locked up as soon as possible being 24 years old. And I do think that when you're looking at it from a projection standpoint, Mike, he's going to be a top four, top five quarterback uh, as long as he's a starter in this league. Yeah. Um, we'll see what happens with Jalen moving forward. I would imagine that uh, order of business should be taken care of here between now and the draft. Of course, the draft season is here. Andrew Desheko, that's where he shines. And we will certainly start talking. If, if they have the 10th, they do have it. If they draft 10, Andrew, uh, what position – would you imagine 
would be a target? Well, I'd certainly look at cornerback because when you look at what the Eagles have in terms of building blocks, there aren't any young defensive backs outside of C.J. Gardner-Johnson who the Eagles would have to even retain. He's going to have a sizable payday of his own that they can really count on as being a cornerstone for the future. Obviously, Darius Slay's getting a little bit longer in the tooth. James Bradbury's likely on his way out. Uh, I really do think they need to add a young corner to, to really uh, fortify that back end for the foreseeable future. So I'd be looking at someone like a Joey Porter Jr., possibly at the, at the 10 spot. All right, uh, that's coming. We'll have plenty of coverage on the draft. Pick number 10, pick number 30, because there's only 31 picks in the first round this year. Andrew DeCecco, Inside the Birds, and the Inside the Birds podcast. Andrew, great work all week long in Arizona, and now we look forward to the offseason, sadly. Appreciate you, buddy. Talk soon. All right, Andrew DeCecco, everybody.